So can everybody hear me? I hope I'm Andreas Kaiser. I'm uh, co-hosting with um, Clark, Clancy Clark, this SSAT PG and CME um, webinar. I think it will be um, a great um, collection of talks that we will um, hear from different speakers. Let me introduce myself real quick. I'm um, currently the um, Chief of Colorectal Surgery at the um, City of Hope National Medical Center in Duarte. I was in, uh, at USC for 20 years and moved in January over here. Uh, my co-host will introduce himself as well. Clancy Clark, great to have everyone here this evening or uh, daytime for those on the West Coast. Uh, I'm Clancy Clark, I'm a hepatobiliary surgeon from uh, North Carolina at Wake Forest and uh, excited to hear what our speakers have uh, to share with us uh, and look forward to uh, participating in a meaningful discussion. The purpose of this webinar is really centered not so much about showing many series of outcomes, et cetera, but really talk a little bit about the um, right way to introduce new technology. We all try to push the envelope. We all try to do something new and fancy and so forth, but maybe we introduce a new tool that really hasn't really um, established a track record yet. And so how do we talk about that to our patients? How do we do it in a um, ethically sound fashion and so forth? These are the topics that we'd like to address. And the first um, speaker uh, is Andrew Duffy here. The first speaker um, will be Andrew Duffy. He's um, uh, the Associate Surgical Chief in the Yale uh, New Haven Health Systems uh, Digestive Health and uh, Service Line. Um, he will talk to us about uh, non-urgent surgery. I won't touch the patient before bariatrics. Andrew, thank you very much for um, taking the time and commitment to give this presentation. Thank you very much. I'm just trying to share my screen here. Uh, hopefully that's projecting okay now. So the title of the slide is Non-Urgent Surgery, I Won't Touch the Patient Before Bariatrics, which is an interesting title because that, uh, in some ways, that kind of a, implies that weight loss is absolutely necessary and the patient should go away and come back when they've lost the weight, but that's not how I interpret that uh, at all. Um, I'm a social professor at Yale. I'm a former director of the Bariatric Surgery Program at Yale. I also have a robust foregut and hernia practice. And those practices over, overlap quite a bit and obesity is a central component of a lot of the diseases that I treat. Now, this, these are my disclosures. I like to diversify my uh, conflicts of interest, but I don't think any of them directly affect this talk. The video running on the side is actually um, a robotic redo uh, foregut operation, in this case a slip Nissen, unfortunately one of my own Nissens. Um, a lot of the surgery that I do is uh, quite complex and the weight of the patient can, can affect the outcomes. Minor technical difficulties here. Um, <clears throat> The goals of this talk today is I want to review some of the risk factors for bad outcomes in elective surgery, talk about how we quantify the risks and minimize or mitigate the risks for, for patients and apply it towards uh, elective treatments and how this can impact the overall uh, treatment strategy. If you do a search on the effects of obesity on uh, surgical complications of elective surgery, I can't quickly came up with 765 results, and you can see from the graphs here that there's more and more data getting published on this every year, and this affects every area of elective surgery from orthopedics to spine, other aspects of neurosurgery, hernia surgery, uh, cancer surgery. I'm going to focus on this topic from the perspective of uh, elective hernia repair, which is a big part of my practice. And, uh, particularly abdominal wall reconstruction. A lot of these operations I do robotically, but a lot of them are done open also. And certainly the concerns about infections, wounds, complications, mesh issues, 
uh, are, are always there. And there's also the whole issue of trying to create enough space to get all the uh, hernia contents back in the abdomen. The goals of elective hernia repair are to create a durable repair from a hernia defect and to try and improve or restore abdominal wall function. We, we often will use a tissue repair or reinforce with mesh and try and avoid uh, bridging and to leave the patient with a very good functional abdominal wall. We're also looking to minimize the pain and disability, both post-operatively and long-term. And obviously we want to minimize the post-operative wound complications and infections, and those can lead to complete failure of the repair. Plenty has been published about the complications related to these operations, including the issues of surgical site events, which run around 20%, and infections, which can run 8 or 9%. So clearly, there's a pretty significant impact in being able to reduce these complications, however uh, they, they may come up. There's a lot of ways you can modify risk factors. You can focus on things like wound healing and hernia recurrence risk factors. Obesity is right at the top of the list for, for a lot of that. Also, factors like smoking and diabetes, status of the previous implants of mesh, whether they're infected or not, was there a previous MRSA infection, is there a stoma involved? What's the nutritional status of the patient? Some of these risk factors are modifiable, things like uh, getting patients to, to stop smoking. Um, things like diabetes can be improved. You can improve the hemoglobin A1C and get the diabetic control down and reduce the risk factors there. Sometimes you can reverse the stoma and you can certainly improve patients' nutritional status when you're addressing these for, ele for elective surgery. So where does obesity fall, fall in this? Is this a modifiable risk factor? It certainly seems like it's not for a lot of people. Other concerns, obviously, are things like cancer history, radiation fields, whether patients are on chemotherapy, whether they're on immunosuppressants like steroids or rapamycin, which may uh, impede healing. So there's a lot of factors, but some of these we have some control over. There's ways to quantify risk factors for surgery. I, I like using the NISQIP calculator here. I punched in a hypothetical patient on this one who happens to be a 65-year-old male uh, obese, diabetic, and a smoker. And as you can see here, the risk of, of any complication pretty much double under this risk calculator. So certainly there are things we can do, like I said, smoking cessation enforcement in patients for elective surgery. You can improve diabetes control. But what about the weight? How can you affect that? There are certainly special cases, and unfortunately a lot of these patients end up in my clinic. And this uh, unfortunate gentleman had had a hernia repair done elsewhere and developed a chronic mesh infection. This was actually after an attempted laparoscopic uh, repair, which got converted to open mostly because of his girth. He is a diabetic, but actually had pretty good blood sugar control. He was a pack a day smoker and really wasn't ready to quit. And when I saw him, this was not an elective case anymore. He had an active infection and it spread. Uh, he also didn't have bariatric insurance coverage, which is required in our state for bariatric procedures. So offering him bariatric surgery as part of the treatment was not really an option. Uh, I modified the plan in this particular patient after a long dis discussion about the different factors involved in his care, but the main thing was controlling the infection. He ended up getting a paniculectomy done with a mesh excision, a repair of a second hernia done primarily, and then the uh, large defect of the umbilicus was repaired with the antibiotic impregnated mesh material. This is probably not a durable repair in this gentleman, but it, it took care of the acute issue. This is a more elective type situation. This is a patient that was sent to me initially with a hernia, incisional hernia after an open colorectal procedure. He's not the largest patient I've ever operated on, a body mass index of 42. And this is a pre-op scan that I had on the left side. And I had a long discussion with him about how we could reduce his, own, his risks for hernia recurrence and healing problems after surgery. And we decided that the sleep gastrectomy was going to be the right operation for him. And I did that operation staying away from the hernia and pretty much ignoring the hernia during that operation. And you, as you can see, over six months, he lost a significant, significant amount of weight, about 10 BMI points or almost 100 pounds. And you can see on these profiles and the CAT scans done about the same level, but he had, we've induced some laxity in the abdominal wall, which certainly facilitated his abdominal closure, also reduced the intra-abdominal fat as well as the extra abdominal fat. And this actually ended up being a fairly straightforward hernia repair, done open, or, where I was able to reconstruct the abdominal wall, rebuild the midline, and reinforce it with a uh, retrorectus mesh, and had, he had no wound uh, issues and had excellent function afterwards. And I think this was the right approach in this gentleman who initially had not been thinking about weight loss as part of the strategy. 
uh, but explaining it to him carefully and going through the pros and cons and how it would affect his hernia repair and his overall health, he became a lot more enthusiastic uh, about that approach. And the fact he was able to lose all this weight in six months shows me that he bought right into it and was really motivated to, uh, to succeed. This is another patient of mine, and this goes to show what can happen with what should have been a routine umbilical hernia done a long time ago in the setting of obesity as it broke down and, uh, and fell apart. This patient also had a uh, hysterectomy and ended up with uh, an interesting complication of a periapatic abscess that had to be drained, and she developed a complex hernia at that uh, level too. When she first walked into my clinic, she just wanted me to fix the hernia. And again, we had that discussion, but this is probably not a feasible repair or a durable repair. And certainly you're not gonna be able to reconstruct the abdominal wall unless there's significant uh, adjustments to, to her, her, her weight and the overall space that we have to deal with in reconstructing the abdomen. I was actually able to do a sleeve gastrectomy on her too, working through with what was left of the upper upper abdominal wall, again, avoiding the hernia. And this is another motivated patient who six months after surgery, uh, she had melted away around her hernia and had given me a lot more tissue to, to work with uh, and also set herself up quite nicely for uh, a paniculectomy. Unfortunately, during the time period we were waiting for her to recover, she developed a small bowel obstruction, and there's my very dilated sleeve at this point. And this gives you an idea about the loss of the main issues, and you can see some old mesh in there, and you can see that most of the intestine and most of the colon are outside of the abdominal wall. But looking at this closely, most of the abdominal uh, musculature is still intact, and there's not a big tissue defect. And this, this scan actually helped me figure out the, uh, the best strategy uh, to, to repair her. Um, frankly, I was gonna get a pre-op scan anyway, and she happened to get one in the emergent setting. Luckily, this uh, small bowel obstruction resolved uh, conservatively with NG tube management, but I was able to get her in and get her operated on uh, shortly after this, uh, once she had recovered from the, from the obstruction. This is what it looked like two weeks after an open tar, and I'll admit I'm not a plastic surgeon. And one of the reasons why this wound is, is so high up here is because I deliberately made sure the incision was not gonna be in the groin crease to help minimize the, the infection. I was able to rebuild her abdominal wall and put a subway mesh in, in this case, fixing both a transverse hernia and a large recurrent umbilical hernia and excise all the previous mesh. And certainly I would not have been able to get her back together like this without significant pre-op weight loss. She actually had an excellent functional result. And this is her two months later. You can see in a two and a half years later, and I follow these patients long-term because of my bariatric patients, which has given me a nice uh, chronology for how the hernia repair works. And she has full function in her abdominal wall and it had essentially no complications for, from these operations. And I'm convinced this is the right strategy in a patient like this. So this is my overall approach to reducing wound complications and infection, particularly in the hernia situation. Um, I, you really have to optimize pre-op factors wherever you can, smoking cessation, glucose control, and there are surgical and non-surgical options for, for weight loss. And I think we have to provide options. You can't simply tell a patient, you gotta go lose 50 pounds or 100 pounds and come back and I'll take care of you because that's not really helping them get to the goal. At least as a bariatric surgeon, I can offer uh, some help with that. Tentacle factors during a case include minimizing the wound size overall, ex excising redundant soft tissue like I did on that last patient to minimize the flaps and the dead space, the careful mesh handling. Uh, I tried to limit transfascial sutures because they seem to be uh, uh, points for uh, infection, uh, potential infection entry. I rarely place drains, and all these points can, can be discussed in separate talks, but I also do a multi-layer wound closure, usually with a subcuticular closure, again, to try and minimize the possibility of, uh, of infection. Overall, I think for elective surgery, we need to try and reduce these risks as much as possible. We have to look at obesity and weight as a big part of that. Certainly, minimizing these issues is gonna reduce morbidity and mortality and cost, but I think we have to offer weight loss services under guidance to improve outcomes and compliance. Bariatric surgery is feasible in most of these patients with stage intervention after weight loss. And running a busy hernia practice, I see a lot of patients coming in who obesity is part of their disease profile and why maybe their hernia recurred uh, multiple times in the past. And I think it's important to have a frank and straightforward and non-judgmental talk with them about their weight and to see how we can 
potentially get them into a better position for their overall health and to make the likelihood of this, the complex operations like the ones I've described being successful long term. Thank you very much. Dr. Kaiser, you're muted. I still don't know Zoom 100%. So anyway, thank you very much for these wonderful pictures and the talk. Um, uh, the, as the organizer, we have decided that we keep the question and answer uh, section until the end of the whole um, uh, talk sessions. So if you would like to have um, a question and answer, please submit your question through the chat feed in the, in the Zoom and we'll go and address them uh, at the end of the talk. Clancy, you wanna introduce the next speaker, please? Thank you for that uh, great uh, introduction. Uh, uh, Dr. Duffy, uh, very controversial topic of obesity um, as a sort of rate limiting step in managing surgical disease. Um, Heather Yeo uh, comes from Cornell. Uh, she is going to present uh, a different perspective on uh, colorectal surgery and titled, I am better than the published data. Laparoscopy is not better than open, robotic not better than laparoscopy. Quite controversial. So we'll look forward to hearing her talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Clark and Dr. Kaiser for the invitation. Uh, I modified it slightly so it's not so self-focused. So it's not just, am I better than the published literature? It's really, are you better than the published literature? Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit in a brief uh, run through in 10 minutes of the, the literature of LAP versus open versus robotic and, and colorectal cancer. Um, oops, see if I can get things to move forward. Uh, there we go. Um, I don't have as many uh, disclosures. I am a medical advisor for a cancer news network called SurvivorNet, uh, which is unrelated to my talk here today. As we all know, um, and the reason that we're here is that in colorectal surgery, minimally invasive techniques have increased over the past decade from laparoscopic to robotic to more recently some of the TA, uh, TME uh, procedures. And in large part, what we know is that perioperative outcomes have been better with MIS techniques. We've seen shorter length of stay, less blood loss, faster return to bowel function, lower rates of surgical site infections, less morbidity, lower rates of hernia, uh, but in the United States, actually, only about 40% of colorectal cancer procedures um, at the, and this is a little bit of old data, but most recent published data is, is being done with any type of minimally invasive surgery, and much of that is uh, hand-assisted, uh, so probably not allowing for the full advantage of MIS techniques. Uh, there's some theories that robotic surgery, as has been introduced, might allow for an increased adoption of MIS techniques because of the question of an easier or lower learning curve, an easier adoption in private practice settings, and an easier transition from open to minimally invasive techniques. Where the controversy really lies around laparoscopic and minimally invasive surgery in colorectal cancer for us is in the realm of TME. Uh, we know that in right colons and left colons, in general, patients generally do well and have good outcomes, but the question really comes around rectal cancer where a tight closed space and margins are particularly important. And so figuring out whether that should be done open, whether that should be done lap, robotic, or through TATME approaches um, is really kind of where the controversy lies and where the question is. Uh, as this controversy has continued to grow, so has the literature on it. And I did a similar search to Dr. Duffy, although I, mine was a little more lowbrow in Google Scholar. But just looking at uh, LAP versus open versus robotic, in the last uh, year alone, in 2020, we come up with 3,000 results related to that. So if you look at some of these other, you know, I did some other searches, just LAP versus open. And in a year, it's about a thousand for, for all of these, each of these different uh, cases. So clearly I'm not gonna go through the full literature today, but I do wanna summarize a, a little bit 
and talk about some of the key important studies that it's important for people to be familiar with. So there are a number of randomized controlled trials comparing the different techniques to one another. The trials that I think it's important to be familiar with, uh, the UK trial uh, called the classic trial, the Korean trial out of Korea, the color trial, which is another European trial, and the ISOCOG Z6051, which is out of the US and Canada, and a la carte more recently. I think that these are the key trials to look at. And really, um, we, as I mentioned, for MIS outcomes, we do see decreased morbidity, mortality. But when it comes to the surgical oncology outcomes, all of these trials have fared, failed to show any difference in 10-year overall survival, uh, failed to achieve non-inferiority of laparoscopy, or failed to show a significant difference in any of the longer-term outcomes. The more recent uh, roller trial, although long-term outcomes um, have not been published, and although the primary endpoint really was conversion to open and not oncologic outcomes, has really failed to show a difference or failed to show a, um, a, a lack of inferiority of uh, the robotic. So again, I'm not gonna delve into those because I think uh, in 10 minutes, we obviously can't get through them, but overall, we haven't seen major oncologic outcome differences in lap, open, or robotic. A more recent trial um, that was a network meta-analysis, for those not familiar, a network meta-analysis uh, is a meta-analysis that uses statistical methods to compare different, uh, different treatments head-to-head -head that are actually not compared in individual trials, but uses randomized controlled data and, and adjustments to compare different outcomes uh, shows us very similar results looking at 30 randomized trials that have been done in these different categories. And overall, we see that this, in this network meta-analysis of 30 trials, from, uh, when we're looking at oncologic outcomes, there's really no difference between open robotic, open lab, or TATME. And in fact, when we look at some of the oncologic outcomes, and, and you'll see the the margin of confidence is wide in these. It is wider in the network meta-analyses because they aren't directly compared head to head. But still, we really don't see differences in intact TME, CRM, uh, or lymph node yield. Where we do see differences, no surprise, is in operative time, which is obviously shorter in more in the open cases, um, and in blood loss, which is usually larger in the open cases. But I think. The, the, the majority of the data that are out there uh, do not support any major oncologic differences uh, despite, regardless of technique. There are problems with the literature and, and these are the problems that we all say. I mean, much of it is comparing apples to apples or apples to oranges um, where people are either early in the learning curve in their MIS and long in their learning curve in open techniques. Most of these are done at major academic centers. So you're really getting the, the folks who are skilled at these. Most of these are done by specialists, unlike where most colon surgery, colon cancer surgery is being done in the United States now, which is not at academic set centers. So the question is, these are the best results that we can expect and MIS techniques have not always shown better outcomes. Um, and they really do show that probably one technique is not better than another. It's really what the surgeon is best at and what the surgeon is more comfortable with. We do know that high volume centers do better. And again, that data means that this is not necessarily transferable to the general community. So in a whirlwind of, of uh, 30 plus 10 randomized trials and the thousands of literature uh, data, I think what we have shown is that LAP, open, robotic, and the TATME techniques seem to be oncologically safe, but really surgical approach needs to defi be defined by tumor and patient characteristics. And when performing a minimally invasive approach, we should feel comfortable to, to, to work in our field where we, we feel most comfortable. But if we are worried about margin or uh, completeness of our TME and dissection, it's important to feel comfortable with conversion. So the question is, am I better than the published literature? Are you better than the published literature? I think it's important that we collect our own data so that you can have that conversation with patients. 
I think that we'll talk about that in some of the next talks here is really where the ethical boundaries lie. Um, we may not be better than the published literature. I, I don't do TATME, so I am not better than the published literature. Um, I need to have that conversation if a patient wants that procedure. Um, but I think it really depends on surgeon experience, surgeon volume, patient characteristics, what devices are being used, and where you are in your learning curve, um, which I think leads us to our next few talks. So thanks. Thank you for that data-driven discussion, really insightful, um, although quick uh, review. Look forward to the discussion following. Um, so as we said uh, for the first talk, please keep your questions, <clears throat> submit them through the chat, um, and at the end we will have a discussion of all talks together. So the next speaker will be uh, Ankit Patel, um, He's an assistant professor at the Division of uh, General and GI Surgery at the Department of Surgery at Emory uh, University School of Medicine. And he's gonna to talk to us about, uh, uh, his topic will be, this tool is cool, but I have never used it. How should I tell my patient? Ankit, thank you for- Thank you, Dr. Medicine. Clark and Dr. Kaiser uh, for the invitation and SSAT, especially my good friend, uh, Shwanda Sekundi, who who asked me to give a talk about this uh, topic, and uh, um, looks like I really drew the short straw on this one. Um, so I have no cool videos, uh, no real great data, uh, and it took me six months to get this talk ready since we started talking about this in January. Um, let's see. I have no disclosures. Oops. So why does this matter? Um, overall, we have a pretty flawed process for uh, at least uh, surgeons uh, trying to disseminate uh, or use new uh, tools and techniques. If it's pharmaceuticals, we have a huge oversight um, through the regulatory process and standards. It can take 20 years for a drug or a device to make it to market. But once it hits us, there's really not much oversight for new technology. All you have to do is show some sort of non-superiority to a current device and you can get fairly uh, approved quite quickly and then in the hands of, of surgeons. Um, IRBs are really used for tracking patient data and outcomes, uh, really to protect the patient themselves. And overall, there's too many variables. As Dr. Yao mentioned, it's hard to really accomplish randomized controlled trials to um, disseminate this information. Again, with the rise in social media in the last few years, uh, information is, is being published, well, when I say published, uh, disseminated much quicker um, and not through the usual channels. And uh, when you ask most surgeons, uh, they really don't know where to start. And that's the data I'm going to show. And, and, and a lot of this, unfortunately, has been impacted or complicated by COVID. So there's three main scenarios. There's either new technology tools for existing procedure. It could be a new energy device. It could be a new tool that you already use or it's comparable. Uh, not many surgeons will agree, you know, or many surgeons will agree that this really doesn't require that much oversight as long as the FDA is approved and it's a comparable device. You know how to use it, really don't need any special permissions for it, uh, aside getting it through supply chain. But either if it's a new procedure using existing technology or a new procedure using new technology, those are the ones that really uh, require some focus. And that's what I'm going to uh, uh, really talk about and hone on. Um, I do a lot of robotics, and uh, that is, that is my, one of my strengths, so just disseminating that information and, and for a system and uh, nationally as well as far as training goes. So I'll use that as, as examples uh, throughout the talk, but I don't really want to focus on any specific tool or technology and single them out. So not much data out there, but this was in 2016, which looked at about 59 studies uh, that uh, uh, looked at ethical aspects of surgical innovation. Um, and uh, they found four common themes that we'll talk about and really no uh, real uh, agreement or uh, consensus among surgeons, about 1,700 surgeons, what they consider innovation or what they consider new tools or technology. And when you looked at these papers, uh, they broke down to four key components, oversight, the informed consent process, learning curve, and then innovative procedures of vulnerable patients. We'll kind of touch on it, but really not. That's way beyond the scope of this. So oversight. What does that really mean? Uh, there is no overlying innovation committees in your hospitals. Maybe you do and you're super lucky, but 
when I asked around, it was kind of a bunch of blank stares. Some people assumed that was IRB. Some people assumed that was a group of peer surgeons or your colleagues, which is usually your OR committee. Or it could be your division chief or your chief of surgery or your surgical chair. But really, no specific committees. Uh, most of us that do robotics, uh, you know, there's a robotic steering committee. Uh, if not, you should really have one. Uh, we even have uh, entire healthcare system committees for this uh, that uh, helps us determine what procedures we should be doing and where there should be some oversight. But really, there's not an innovation committee unless you count this uh, uh, supply chain committee where new devices and new uh, uh, um, uh, what implants or uh, meshes or uh, objects, surgical objects are vetted out. There's a lack of agreement overall in the community of what is innovation versus research. Um, for this scope, innovation, they broke down to three major uh, categories. You know, either it's a minor modification of a standard procedure, a lot of debate if this even needs oversight. Uh, this could be just doing a, uh, let's say, say, since we're talking about hernias, it could be a ventral hernia, just doing it a little bit differently. Maybe it's, it's an older technique, or maybe you're modifying it to newer devices. Um, uh, a major modification of standard procedure or new innovation. Um, this could be what a transversus abdominis release could be uh, in its infancy a few years ago. Uh, most would agree some sort of formal review might be needed, but there's no agreement what the formal review would be. Would it be IRB because you're tracking patient information? Is it something uh, locally through institutions that think, hey, I'm going to do this procedure. I, I've done parts of a procedure or I've done uh, parts of it using this technology. Now I'm going to put it together. Or is it innovation new to institution validated elsewhere? This could be a uh, 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 robotic inguinal hernia, uh, which you know maybe your institution is not doing it, but everyone else in the world is doing it, and it's been validated, and you're trying to bring that to your institution. Most would recommend some sort of review or some sort of vetting process. And of course, oversight, one of the things that you shouldn't overlook is potential danger to patients, but also cost and conflict of interest, which is a huge topic online. Um, there's always going to be some sort of conflict of interest, but you know, uh, if, if there's a personal interest, you know, you should vet that out. Informed consent. We're very familiar with this, but it should include all the following: what's the innovative nature of the procedure, what's the surgeon's learning curve. We'll talk about that. Risk and benefits, outcomes. You know, unknown as well, uh, which is really hard to do. Uh, the evidence. What is the evidence out there, or is there any evidence? And then what are the alternatives, which is likely what you already do in practice? Learning curve. We could probably spend an hour on this and uh, we talk about it all the time. Is it based on case volumes, which is pretty antiquated? Uh, but look through your credentialing process. I guarantee there's some old lines or old paragraphs in there that actually say, hey, if you've done one of these cases, you're suddenly credentialed. Um, it's debatable. There's no true definition, but it should include some sort of training, uh, whether it's hands-on, wet lab, dry lab, visiting other surgeons or facilities or proctors. Obviously, the last two have been very impacted with COVID, traveling restrictions, going to other places to learn the technology, and now a lot of this is done virtually. The credentialing process, quite interesting. Um, even in our institution, when we redid all of our robotic credentialing, we realized we were using 20 stuff that was 20 years old and was completely outdated. You could literally jump on a robot, do two cases, and be credentials for 10 years later and you've never touched the system. Um, and all of that can, you know, you can find some loopholes and uh, impact, and, you know, possibly even change all of that. Uh, again, they talked about this fourth topic. We'll skip it. This is mostly for emergencies or patients that have this refractory disease. You know, what do you do at that point? Uh, you know, they're coming to you and you may have this new technique or you want to try something out. Usually these are done through IRBs and not really a, a cool tool that you'd be trying out uh, globally. So that's all great. Where do, does one start? Well, the ACS, uh, American College Surgeon has a great bulletin on this. You know, what are the surgeon's obligations to a patient? Um, and four main topics, you know, offer the best procedure that you can per personally perform, use the best tools available to you. Uh, but obviously ensure patient safety and then full disclosure. So I made a pathway, and this is what uh, most of the innovation topics or credentialing process kind of go over, and that's what we do in our medical executive committee as well. Number one, you know, as a surgeon, you should always educate yourself 
and your team members regarding any tools or procedures that you're going to do. Do the best you can. Use the, all the available resources you have. First, it's a dry lab, wet lab, uh, simulations, case observations. Obviously, all this is changing with COVID. Now we're using a lot of virtual meetings and videos. But even if it's the slightest change to any devices, you have to know how to use it. If you don't understand it, you're likely going to cause some harm, and uh, that's not the point of this. Number two, uh, notify your peers. Now, this could be debated. This could be just even your just chief. It could be your team members. It could be your uh, local or committee, the one that kind of looks over procedures in your institution. The intent to use a tool. A lot of times you have to get permission anyway to bring the tools in. That's your vetting process. Check your institutional guidelines. Every place that's, we have seven hospitals. Each hospital has its own guidelines, but there's some overriding themes to it that, uh, that you need to go through may need eventual IRB if it's a new procedure or if it doesn't have FDA clearance. You know, robotic thyroids, it's a great example. A lot of places do them, but a lot of them are done under IRB because the FDA has not cleared that for robotic uh, uh, an approach. It's not an FDA clear procedure. Even today, um, I do a lot of parasophageals and bariatrics. Um, it's clear for Nissen fundifications, but it's not clear for parasophageal hernias. Now, some of us that do these procedures, we realize that these are two uh, intertwined procedures. This doesn't make any sense. Um, and ultimately, disclose to the patient. If you're using something new, um, detail informed consent, have a backup plan, and then most importantly, follow outcomes. If you don't follow outcomes, then you really don't know if you're actually doing anything different or um, benefiting the patient. So in conclusion, hard topic to talk about in 10 minutes, but new tools are cool and we can use them safely. Educate yourself first. Uh, know the device, know the procedure, uh, know your strengths and limitations. All of us uh, have that certain strengths. I do minimally invasive surgery. Picking up the robot was not really a big deal. Versus my partner, who is an open surgeon, trying to learn the robot, different algorithm to that. Um, and, and you have to disclose that patient even when his first patient comes up. Ask your chief of surgery or your division chief or your peer uh, for guidance. Uh, a lot of us don't know where to start. That's usually a good place. Um, and then find the right patient, not, not just the first patient who walks in. It's like, suddenly I've trained for this. I'm going to use it on the first patient who walks in. No, you got to find the right patient, right pathology, um, and you got to set yourself up for success. And then, of course, record and disseminate information. In this era, you can do a cool procedure, look at a cool tool, tool but if you don't show the pluses and minuses, no one else will know, and they'll uh, uh, do the same, or they may repeat the same mistakes you may have done. Uh, thank you. Hopefully that was like 10 minutes and uh, uh, available for questions at the end. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Excellent talk. Um, Dr. Clark, do you want to introduce? Again, we, we reserve the question and answer until the end of the whole session. Great. So our uh, last talk of the evening um, is uh, continuing this uh, theme. Um, we're going to discuss um, by uh, Luca Stoshi. It is uh, TME, robotics, TMIS, TMS, fancier function versus function, the case of balancing ego versus patient goals. Um, thank you uh, for, again, all the participants and looking forward to our last talk. Thank you, Dr. Clark, and thank you, Dr. Kaiser, for the invitation. I have uh, no disclosures, and uh, uh, the outline, I will we'll start with TAMIS and TEM, and then robotic surgery, and ultimately TATME. One of the themes of this session is how to accept new technology, and I think that TEM, uh, transanal endoscopic microsurgery, has been introduced a long time ago but became more popular when there were studies indicating that uh, realistic outcomes uh, could be better than in the traditional uh, transanal excision. And in particular, uh, there are studies conducted not in the far past indicating that TM was associated with decreased rates of margin positivity, lesion fragmentation and recurrence compared with traditional transanal excision for rectal lesions, particularly cancer. Subsequently, TAMIS, which is transanal minimally invasive surgery, was described as an alternative to TEM, 
without a specific uh, instrument and setting and more uh, amenable to use by surgeons familiar with laparoscopic surgery and uh, without incurring the expense of uh, buying the TEM entire setting. And Dr. again, Do you have images or slides to share? We don't, I don't see your screen. I'm um, sorry, I thought I did. Sorry to um, interrupt. Uh, how do I, should I click share screen, is that? Correct. Sorry. So to go back, um, the acceptance of new technique is based on uh, objective improvement in uh, uh, acceptable and rec widely recognized outcomes. And this has been true for TEM and is being true for TAMIS, which is transanal minimal invasive surgery, which was described as an alternative to TEM. So for example, when looking at the possibility of uh, generalizing the advantages of TAMIS in a single institution, uh, there was uh, uh, a, a sizable learning curve to achieve proficiency that was calculated between 14 and 24 cases, defining proficiency as microscopic positive resection margin. And the positive resection margin overall was 7%. This could be generalized at least among surgeons in a single institution. And that is how the technique has been uh, progressively accepted. When comparing TAMIS with TEM, which was the older technology, TAMIS was associated with shorter operative times. The poor quality excision, meaning fragmented specimen or positive margins had the same rate and the peritoneal violation rate also was similar. And most importantly, the local recurrence rate in case of malignancy and the uh, cancer outcomes were comparable. Therefore, because of the shorter operative times and uh, generally uh, more practical usage of the technique, TAMIS was accepted. And that is a way where new technology can be accepted. And there hasn't been a lot of literature opposing TAMIS or demonstrating that the old transanal excision technique is better. Let's switch now to robotic surgery. It was described for uh, total mesorectal excision in 2006 and a number of single institutional studies have indicated benefits from several places all over the world. Uh, the advantages as, as known, greater visualization, reduced surgeon fatigue, reduced conversion and uh, uh, appropriate cancer operation. There are concerns regarding cost, which I will not cover in this uh, particular talk. And there is evidence that introduction in fellowship training can be done without adverse outcomes. So this has led, as Dr. Yeo also alluded to, to a randomized trial, the ROLAR, com comparing laparoscopic and robotic surgery. And uh, this indicated an absolute value of conversion that was favorable for La, uh, robotic surgery versus laparoscopy, but this was not statistically significant. However, the uh, preoperative morbidity and uh, complete mesorectal excision and circumferential radial margin involvement were comparable. And so uh, probably the, the study was under power to detect advantages for robotic surgery, but at least confirm safety associated with robotic surgery. Once this has uh, evolved into wide acceptance, even within the confines of what somebody could define as a select subgroup of surgeons, which is those working in Nesque participating institution, there has been some studies indicating that robotic surgery could be worse than laparoscopic or open surgery. And in this particular study published in 2020, uh, but related to a, uh, subset of patients assessed in 2016 out of a, over a thousand cases, you can notice that only less than 20% were performed robotically and 60% uh, were performed open. 
And uh, when looking at uh, a combined uh, uh, oncologic resection, uh, combined outcome of at least 12 lymph nodes, negative distal margin and negative circumferential margin, uh, open and robotic approaches had decreased likelihood of successful oncologic resection. So this could be a study that raises uh, issues regarding the use of robotic surgery. However, what is interesting is that in perusing the literature, another study using the same subgroup of patients conducted, uh, uh, conducting, uh, receiving rectal cancer surgery in 2016, but with the different uh, design using propensity score matching to offset the differences between comorbidities and risk factors did not indicate that robotic was worse and actually indicated that conversion rate was better and reduced after robotic compared to laparoscopic surgery and the odd ratio for positive circumferential margins were comparable among robotic, open and laparoscopic surgery. Let's switch now on TATME, uh, which is probably the newer technique that is being assessed among the ones that uh, I've been assigned to discuss and was described in 2010 and combined elements of TA and TAMIS and the transanal transabdominal uh, uh, approach for ultra low anterior resection and coloanal anastomosis. And the rationale is improved visualization and accuracy in rectal dissection using a perineal approach. There has been an international TME, TA TME registry that has collected data and has now published on almost 1600 cases. And when looking at primary endpoint, uh, which was defined as an astomatic failure, which is a composite of uh, leak, pelvic abscess, fistula, sinus, and anastomotic structure, the anastomotic failure rate was fairly high compared to other techniques at almost 16%. And the risk factors, however, were the usual that one would expect, males, obesity, smoking, et cetera. There has been uh, uh, a concern about the use of TATME regarding a number of issues, intraoperative adverse events, especially during the transanal phase, carbon dioxide embolism, an astomatic leak rate has been uh, uh, described as somewhat high, but this is again is a developing technique. But they're also concerned about long term functional results and oncologic results. For example, in Norway, uh, the assessment of the initial TATME cases led to a moratorium on the use of total mesorectal excision, especially because the surgeons noticed that there was a recurrence pattern for local recurrence characterized by a rapid multifocal growth in the pelvic cavity and sidewalls rather than a distinct lesion. And this moratorium led to a subsequent study awaiting for a full audit of the cases in Norway. And that led ultimately to abandonment, at least for the time being of totem, transanal total mesorectal excision because the estimated local recurrence rate was very high compared to the cases done using other techniques in the National Cancer Registry. There was a high rate of anastomotic, technique, uh, anastomotic leak and a high rate of permanent stoma rate among the patients treated with this technique. Therefore, there are ongoing trials that uh, will try and uh, uh, and address these issues, uh, one in North America and uh, others in Europe and in France, continental Europe and one limited to France, which will need to address these particular issues as they're advocates, but they're also opponents of this technique. When looking at uh, all techniques combined and reflecting uh, another study similar to do what Dr. Yeo presented, a meta-analysis on over 6,000 patients compare open uh, laparoscopic robotic and TATME. And uh, the morbidity was uh, comparable and there was a comparable five-year overall survive, survival and local recurrence rate. However, robotic technique was uh, associated with longest operative time. However, also associated with shortest length of stay 
decreased postoperative morbidity and wound infection were noted after laparoscopic technique versus open, decreased wound infection rate after robotic. And on the negative side, there was a higher rate of incomplete and nearly complete mesorectal excision when comparing laparoscopic and open technique. And laparoscopic surgery resulted, at least in this study, in increased rates of circumferential resection positive margins compared to TA TME. And there was a longest distal resection margin after robotic versus other techniques. Therefore, the authors concluded that laparoscopic and robotic approaches may improve postoperative recovery, and the open and transanal approaches may improve oncological resection. However, technique selection should be based on expected benefits by individual patient, and this is the verbatim of their paper. And I think I agree in, in, uh, uh, with the authors uh, that it's very difficult to assess what is uh, uh, practically useful to the individual surgeon based on the literature. I would argue that probably it's not a good idea to always jump on the bandwagon of the new controversial technique. On the other hand, we need to recognize that there's a need to advance science. There's a need for people to experiment with new technology, and this should be done in the appropriate setting. It's difficult to balance the individual talents versus the technique that helps moving the average forward and therefore balancing risks and benefits ultimately remains an individual surgeon's choice. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great uh, conclusion to our uh, talks today. And at this time we'll open uh, up for questions. Uh, for those who are participating, um, there is a Q&A option where you can uh, enter questions and our speakers uh, can address those questions and we'll take a few minutes um, to allow people to submit their questions if they have not already. So I have a, first of all, I'd like to also thank all the speakers for, for really great talks and I think particularly all together, the highlight a similar problem from different perspectives. Now, go, uh, starting from the last talk to the second talk, um, Dr. Yeo, if you have a technique that really seems to be inferior to the point where a country says we shouldn't do it, is it justifiable to still do that at, let's say you, you're the one. I know you don't do the transanal TME, but is it justifiable to say, I don't believe those results and I can continue? I mean, I, I think that from a ethical standpoint, what needs to be done if you're going to be doing something where there's actually concern you could be harming the patient is it has to be done under the auspices of a trial and with full disclosure to the patients. I think um, I have, I believe that often it's not the technique so much as it is the surgeon. I would, I've seen amazing and excellent TA TMEs performed and I think that the, the procedure can be done well. But I do think there's, for many of these procedures, there's a complicated learning curve and uh, figuring out where that is should be done under the auspices of a clinical trial. And as Dr. Patel said, with full disclosure to the patients. There are patients out there who will benefit from novel techniques and trials based on their habit, body habitus, based on their tumor, based on their tumor location. And, and so, I think having that discussion with the patient of, you know, I've done a lot of these, I have experience, here are my, here are my data, um, I believe that, I, that this procedure will be helpful for you, I think is the important point. If that answers your question. Well, I mean, it opens a lot, many more questions. Obviously, it's not as easy an answer. 
I mean, I think particularly in oncologic resection, you know, where there's a question of oncologic outcome in patients, um, I'm a little bit more cautious for new technologies um, when I, if I think there might be a compromise in oncologic outcomes. If you can salvage the oncologic outcomes with a second procedure or something, I think that, that that's a discussion to have. For example, local excision and then salvage or, or something like that. I, mean, I think the, the topic also extends even further. Let's say you um, start out your practice, right? I mean, you, you can't say I've done cases 400 times. And so how do you tell your patients that you are a young faculty, um, you've done your training and you have your um, certification, all that stuff, but you haven't really done it all that many times on your own? So I think that's, that's a difficult uh, topic. I think um, Dr. Patel brought up some really intriguing concepts about, around this area of talking to your patient and the introduction of technology. And I think what was not entirely clear, and I'll just state it, um, is that we're talking about after market, after FDA approval. We're not talking about device development. So as soon as you start tinkering uh, and putting tools together to leave them behind, whether that's I chose to make some homemade mesh and I, I autoclaved it and then implanted it in someone because I think my homemade mesh is better than anything on the market, um, that's a device that doesn't have FDA approval. But if you say, well, I'm going to use mesh and wrap it around the pancreas because I think I can make the pancreas heal quicker. Um, that's, although the mesh has been FDA approved to be for a hernia repair, it's not been approved to decrease leak after pancreas uh, resection. So there's a conversation about using the device, uh, whatever it is, whether it's a robot or uh, for TME, a microscope or whatever, where it's not been approved uh, from FDA. That's one conversation here. The other is, the conversation about introducing new techniques and how many operations do we have out there that have a name attached to them because that one surgeon did that operation so many times that they felt they could do it better on their own and came up with a new technique, Nissen or whatever it is. And now we know um, that operation by that surgeon's name because they were pioneers, innovators, and may or may not have had randomized controlled trials or may or may not have uh, reported um, in, a, in a fair, uh, you know, prospective manner, um, consenting each patient saying, I've never done this before, but I think it's going to be better than the last. Um, so there's a conversation there. Um, but we're all, all these conversations are around the, the confidence of the surgeon, along with the confidence that the hospital instills in that surgeon and saying, we trust you as one of our surgeons, because there's actually no laws uh, in most states saying that you can or can't do something. It's left to the privileging board at that hospital. And you highlighted Dr. Patel at Emory has one approach and at Wake we have another approach. And there's no state or federal regulations about what uh, innovations you can introduce or how, what, how you approach a particular operation. Usually you sign a piece of paper that says I can do an appendectomy. There's no clarity about exactly what to do. So what I'd like to hear from the discussants today is, you know, do we need regulatory bodies? Is, is JCO need to participate in this? Should there be an uh, American College of Surgeons or SSAT participate in reviewing and saying that, yes, you are qualified, you have a certificate, you can do that robotic technique, or you are, quote, an innovator, and you just brand it as an innovator, you can do whatever you want, because people believe that you're an innovator right? and you can advance um, surgical science. Any comments there? Boy, that, that's a tough one. Um, uh, I know every society right now wants to have a certificate for every fellow uh, to do something. Uh, that's one, you know, there's, we, I think it's very hard to have any sort of governing body uh, to regulate every little aspect that we do. I mean, surgery is an art. Um, what's good in your hands may be a little bit different in my hands. Uh, the reason we have missins, we have these named techniques is they eventually did publish their data. 
they were, some were, you know, some of it was heresy in the beginning and then eventually it took data to prove that. So that was the, I think the old algorithm. You had to do like 200 procedures and then you publish your data and eventually 10 years later it became like norm. I think now, yes, we use the FDA. And, and again, my talk was for all FDA approved devices, but I mean, how much, how many, again, today I, I've been in robotics for eight years and I found out that parasophageals are not FDA cleared on the XI system, but a NISA is. Who made these rules? I didn't know it. So have I been breaking every rule in the world for my last like 200 paras that I've done? I have no idea. Um, but my healthcare system says I'm perfectly fine to do that. Um, but I, I think we have to leave some wiggle room for innovation. Uh, we have to leave some wiggle room um, to do these procedures. So then maybe one day we'll be, we'll look at the, and, and collect the data ourselves. And then we look at it and say, okay, maybe this wasn't such a great idea. But at that time it was, seemed like a decent idea. And for some of these patients that were not, you know, as Dr. Duffy mentioned, yeah, it's great. I do bariatrics too. Uh, I hate fixing BMI 50 hernias, but sometimes you're forced to do it and you got to do it the best way possible and then move on. Um, I don't have an answer. I, I think you you just have to use guidance from your peers and try not to get in trouble, uh, but do the best job you can with what you have. And yeah, if you wrap mesh around the pancreas, get ready to deal with the ramifications of that in the future um, if you want to do that. And then you have to tell the patient, say, hey, I'm going to try something new. It might work, may not work, but here's my plan A, here's my plan B. And that instills some confidence in the patient as well that you're not just doing something random and then you're going to abandon them something bad. If, I mean, if we didn't cool. take some risk, we wouldn't have half of the procedures we have today. We wouldn't have transplants. We wouldn't have minimally invasive laparoscopic surgery. I think the most important thing is disclosure and discussion with the patients. I, I actually, my partner does a lot of device development and we are very open with the patients about, you know, you are the first, second, third patient that we've used this device and it's FDA approved. But I think that full disclosure is really important for patients. And I also think their use of registries or data tracking is really important. And so that we can go back and study our data and, and figure out what the outcomes are and what the effect is on patients, because we may learn that the technique is not correct and it needs changes. But again, informed consent and, and uh, data collection. But if you are, uh, I mean, if, if we say that a certain procedure has a steep learning curve, you need, let's say, whatever, 25, 50 cases to become proficient in that specific technique. Is it okay to say those, the first 24 or five patients will just be guinea pigs? I mean, I don't think that they're guinea pigs. What I, what I tell patients when I'm doing a new technique with one of my partners is, I've got my partner here, we're gonna work together on your case. Uh, you know, there aren't that many people that have done this procedure and so, here's my backup plan here. If, if, if I'm unable to get this out with, you know, the endoluminal resection, then we're going to do the standard approach that I'm very comfortable with, but you have the potential to benefit from this more minimally invasive procedure. Um, I, I think you have to be open. I think your, your um, point that you made is really important to memorize that you have somebody who can step in to help you for this procedure. If you have, if, you're in your learning curve, it's probably smart to involve somebody else who has just also a lot of experience or more experience in that particular technique, either as a backup or whatever. And I think that's also the beauty of working in your early years after, after training in a, in a bigger institution where you do have other faculty that can step in and help you. And, and you can ask for advice if you're, if you're really getting a little bit to your limit. In my first five years of practice, I operated on a day there was a partner in the room next door. Um, and I think that's probably really the take home message that you should set yourself up in a safe way. But if you can't make progress or if you get into a problem that you have difficulty to manage on your own, that you have other people who step in. And I mean, even senior level surgeons when trying new techniques, run into problems and call in other surgeons. I think we all need to be humble. So let's, let's for the purpose of arguments, say I, I really keep track of all my rectal cancer cases and 
I go over there, I do a retrospective analysis of my own cases, and I find out that every time I have somebody with a BMI above 50, my results suck. So should I, I mean, that's just hypothetical, but should I now call Dr. Duffy and say, I need to have this patient to get a bypass first before I touch the next rectal cancer with a BMI of 50? Well, I'm in New York and my average BMI is 23, I think. So <laughs> I cheat a little bit with my thin Upper East Side patients. Um, I mean, I'm, I don't know if anyone else wants to take this question. I, I think that if you find that you're struggling with certain patients, you have to approach it in some way where you're trying to solve the problem, whether that's counseling them on weight loss, whether that's having seen a bariatric surgeon or reviewing your outcomes with your senior partner and figuring out why you're having worse outcomes in that patient population. So I, I will chime in here. Um, you know, we don't get uh, BMI 23 in North Carolina. Um, 60 is a good one. Um, and I do mostly cancer uh, surgery and usually uh, anxiety combined with, um, with uh, the need um, for the patient to get through their operation so they get the chemotherapy. We're kind of pushed uh, and we don't have much time to lose weight. Um, for Dr. Duffy, can you weigh in on oncologic procedures and weight loss surgery? Because there is about a six month uh, approval period for most weight loss operations. I had a patient recently who asked me, can't you just do my sleeve while you're in there? Um, and I know there are people who are doing clinical trials looking at combining weight loss operations with um, cancer operations or with transplant even. Um, any, any thoughts about treating their obesity disease at the same time um, as their uh, quote needed operation. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's a huge challenge and I was about to comment anyway. I mean, the, the analogy given before about the rectal cancer, I mean, that's, 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 that's a real dilemma. And I think it's important to disclose to these patients that, hey, you're in this category, you are at higher risk for local recurrence simply because of your size or whatever it may be that your data shows. And that's good that you are aware of that data and you can present it to the patient. And you can have a real discussion about what are the options. In a situation like cancer, you obviously have a timing issue. Most of those uh, algorithms are pretty well laid out. Surgery is usually the first factor, like you mentioned, uh, before chemo. But maybe there's some situations where chemo and radiation, like in rectal cancer, are the best option. And you can then look at other strategies to try and get, make that patient a more successful surgical candidate, whether it be weight loss medication, which is an option, or other things. Um, the so do, your, your point about bariatrics is, is, is a big challenge. I mentioned in our state, it's not mandated bariatric coverage, um, which means not all patients have coverage, even if they have insurance. And that, that, that is a problem because there's a certain subset of patients, probably about 30% in the state, who don't qualify no matter what under their existing plan. Then there's a six month rule and most insurances have some delay built into the bariatric process where they have to meet certain criteria, it's usually nutrition or overall wellness visits combined with exercise physiology. The, the rules are changing. I've been successful a few times in getting patients advanced with the support of another surgeon in certain circumstances, a couple of cancer patients actually, mostly related to things like renal cell, which may be a little more slow, slowly growing. Uh, but that makes an operation more feasible and more feasibly minimally invasively in a lot of situations, obviously reduces the patient morbidity. In, in other cases where the, the need is more acute, I think you can look uh, more realistically, is there an opportunity for weight loss intervention later on? If you look at a lot of the uh, gynecologic malignancies, they, the recurrence rates are partially based on the weight of the patient. And so we have looked at intervening in ovarian cancer and uh, uterine cancer patients with weight loss surgery after they've completed their first round of treatment and are healed up enough and are, are off chemo or are, are safe to proceed with an operation that carries risk of leaks and other healing problems. So different ways of looking at it, but it's really hard to try and get those procedures approved to be done at the same time because of the insurance rules. And yeah, otherwise, and then that's, that's a shame because there's a real opportunity there. And it's really almost impossible to get those procedures paid for uh, otherwise. I, I just want to add that I agree. And I think that, the example that Dr. Kaiser pointed out is 
I had complications for patients who had very high BMI. And um, when somebody has a cancer, it's very difficult to uh, achieve weight loss, uh, especially for the greater degrees of obesity before a cancer surgery. So you have to do the best you can uh, to help the patient. But you need to be prepared if somebody has a BMI of 50 to deal with complications. I think that when dealing with benign disease, um, for example, I do not offer J pouch surgery who, with, to patients who have a high BMI. And uh, we can do a total abdominal colectomy, create an ileostomy, and then um, <clears throat> They can embark upon medical management, which I encourage to do before surgical management. And I personally never had a patient who had a bariatric procedure to make the colorectal procedure easier. I think it's a very difficult pathway, but I did have a few who had successful weight loss through medical management, through referral to our medical specialist in bariatric in, in weight loss. And, uh, and could have uh, uh, their J pouch done with a BMI of 30 or, or around there, which is what I tell patients. But I, 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 I would not do, and I haven't done a J pouch on somebody who has a, BM, a, a tall male with a BMI of 35, I wouldn't offer it. Well, sometimes you have to, like next week I have to, um, because the patient has high grade displays on the rectum, so I can't leave the rectum. I, there may be cases like that, and and uh, um, in cancer, if you have a low rectal cancer, you, in my opinion, you don't have really a choice, so you have to deal with that, uh, including doing coloanal in, in heavy patients sometimes. Uh, but most of the times in benign disease, uh, you you can uh, uh, you can uh, embark upon weight loss by changing the surgical plan. I think this is a great discussion um, and I'm sure we can continue with the discussion for another two hours. Do you all have time for that or should we <laughs> at some point call it quits? Maybe next time. Huh? Thank you to all the speakers. It was a great uh, evening event. Uh, I appreciate everyone participating and great discussion. Thank you very much on, uh, to everyone. And also thank you for the people that have um, uh, zoomed in to listen to this webinar. Again, the webinar has been sponsored by the SSAT. Uh, the, uh, there are a number of other um, webinars that are scheduled. So if you want to look at what's on the list for the coming weeks and months, go to the ssat.com. Uh, and you will get um, a overview. And if you are on that website, you might as well join the society if, if you haven't done that so far. Um, I think it's a great society that uh, particularly also for younger faculty or for uh, general surgeons and so forth, has a great opportunity to get in one place uh, a broad exposure to different topics um, uh, that you might come across. So thank you very much. For thank my you. end, any other comments before closing? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.